So here's part two where we are continuing. We left off and we were saying, what shields are we creating for ourselves to create self-protection? And then now, ultimately, the true question is, what does it mean to live under the protection of God? What does that mean? What does that look like to have the creator of the universe protecting us? Now, we'll go to this book called The Great Controversy. If you have not read it yet, I would highly suggest it. It goes through the history of how the Bible was formed and how Bible prophecy is being fulfilled today. But I'll read a section from page 88. It says, Papal thunders were soon hurled against him. Three bulls were dispatched commanding immediate measures to silence the teacher of heresy. So this is talking towards, uh, this is speaking about John Wycliffe and how he was working towards preserving the word of God in the midst of being attacked by uh, the papacy, a religious system that was not 100% interested in the spread of the word of God in its purest biblical form in the time of the Reformation, before the Reformation, when it came to the Dark Ages. So this is just bringing that context in, the, the history. So it says, The arrival of the papal bull is laid upon all England, a command for the imprisonment of the heretic. So they looked at John Wycliffe as a heretic. It appeared certain that Wycliffe must soon fall to the vengeance of Rome. But he who declared to the one of old, fear not, I am thy shield. So it's here, it's referring to the scripture, fear not, I am thy shield. The same promise that went to Abraham, we see that that promise went to John Wycliffe and it also goes to us. Stretched out his hand to protect his servant. Death came, not to the reformer, but to the pontiff who declared his destruction. The death of Gregory the Eleventh was followed by the election of two rival popes. Each called upon the faithful to make war on the other, enforces his demands by terrible anathemas against his adversaries, and promises of reward in heaven to, to his supporters. The rival factions had all they could do to attack each other, and Wycliffe for the time, for a time had rest. The Shikums, with all the strife and corruption which it caused, prepared the way for the Re Reformation by enabling the people to see what the papacy really was. Wycliffe called upon the people to consider whether these two popes were not speaking the truth in condemning each other as the Antichrist. Determined that the light should be carried to every part of England, Wycliffe organized a body of what? Preachers. I love this. Simple, devout men who love the truth and desire to extend it. And I believe that's the same thing that God is raising up today. God is raising up preachers. People who love the word, who study the word, who are consecrated to God, who are dedicated to the word. And this is the calling of Matthew 24, 14, that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. So this is why God is calling us to preach. God is calling us to teach the word of God in its purest form with a humble spirit and a, and a genuine heart that loves Jesus Christ. These men teaching in market places, in streets of great cities and in country lanes sought out the aged, the sick and the poor and opened to them the glad tidings of the grace of God. At Oxford, Wycliffe preached the word of God in the halls of the university. He received the title of the gospel doctor. But the greatest work of his life was to be, was to be the translation of the scriptures into English so that every man in England might read the wonderful works of God. Amen. So this is showing that in the midst of adversary, in, in the midst of attacks, in the midst of all these temptations to stop doing what you're doing, John Wycliffe was bold in faith to know and he held on to the promise that, Lord, you are my shield. So this is an illustration that we can use in regards to preaching Genesis 15, 1, that the Lord is our shield. And, you know, through all of this, we may ask, what does God want us to do? What is God asking us to realize? And what God is asking us to realize is that he is our shield and that you have protection and 
ultimately, God wants us to look at him as our shield so that when we realize through the power of the Holy Spirit that God is our shield and he's our protection, we will have peace in this world. And it's not peace that is based on, it's not peace based on, you know, uh, what's going on outside and what's going on around us, but it's peace knowing that God loves us, God protects us, God is our shield. So ultimately, what God is asking us to do is to walk in peace, to live in peace, to have the peace of God in our life that passes all understanding. So it's not just a promise to Abraham to say, I'm your shield, I'll protect you. It's a promise that God is praying that we could have faith in, we could have belief in, and that the Holy Spirit could come inside of us. So in the midst of our problems, in the midst of our challenges, in the midst of everything that we're going through, we could have peace because we know we have God's protection. We have God's love. We have God's presence in our life. Because if we believe in God and we study the word of God and we listen to God, but we don't have peace, what's the point of our relationship with God? If Jesus is the perfect peace and we claim to believe in Jesus, but we don't live in peace and we don't have peace, then what is the purpose? So God is saying the purpose of this promise, Abraham, the purpose of this promise, Abram, is for you to have peace. And he was worried not only about his protection, but he was worried about his son. Now, God is saying, don't worry about your son. Don't worry about your lineage. Have peace. I'm your shield. I am your protection. I am with you. I am your peace. And Jesus was his peace because Jesus was looking at Abram and saying, I'm coming. I'm coming. So we have a reward so that we could be at peace in this world because every good thing we experience is icing on the cake. Everything we experience is icing on the cake. Everything we experience in this world, all these blessings that we experience, it is just a, it's an after blessing. Because our first blessing is the fact that God created us, He loves us, He redeemed us, and He is our reward. So our ultimate reward, our greatest reward, is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Our ultimate reward, our number one thing that we could be thankful for, is our relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, every award, every award, reward, or blessing that we experience, everything that we experience other than that, is just... That's just secondary. The first and foremost foundation of everything is that relationship that we have with Jesus. So we will come to realize that God is our shield or we ask that question. Will you realize? Will you realize? And this is a key question you can ask. Key question you can ask is will you realize or will you allow God to be your shield? Will Because at the end of the day, God can say, I am your shield. I am your great re reward. But if we don't believe that, if we don't accept that, if we don't receive that, then we miss out. We miss out on the blessing. Why? Because we it, the promise is there, but we're not claiming the promise. So we still need to claim that promise in our life that God is my protection. God is my shield. We will accept this promise and allow this to be our identity. Because when you start to identify, when you start allow God's promises to come in and become your identity, that's when your life becomes transformed. Because you, you, you can't just leave God's promises there and don't claim them. You need to remember that promise. First, you have to learn that promise. You have to, first, you have to hear the promise. Then you can learn the promise. After you hear the promise, then you can learn the promise. After you learn the promise, then you could accept the promise. After you accept the promise, then you can keep the promise. After you keep the promise, then you can memorize the promise and you hold on to that promise. And when you memorize and hold on to the promise, then you can live that promise. And when you're living in the promise, that's when you're transformed. And this is what God is about. This is what Jesus is about. Jesus is in the salvation, saving, transformation industry. That's what his business is. That's what his calling is. That's what his purpose is. He's all about transforming us through his love. And the only way he could transform us is if we can faithfully believe in the promise that he's given us and the blessing that we, he's giving us. Because if we don't believe it as our identity that we are a child of God and he is our shield and he is our protection and he is our provider and he loves us, then we are basically just having our faith there, having our religion there, and we are not living within the religion that God is calling us to be. And the religion that we have is a religion of faith and belief and grace and peace. 
So when people will say I'm getting rid of my religion or I'm getting rid of all these things, it is basically saying that you're getting rid of faithfully believing in the love of God and that relationship that we have with him and that he's calling us to do. And according to James, religion is when we go and visit the orphans and the widows and and uh, people in jail. And what God and what Jesus called his disciples to do when I was sick, you didn't visit me when I was hungry, you didn't feed me when I was in prison, you didn't visit me. And they'll say, when do we see you hungry, Lord? When did we see you in prison? So he's basically God is saying on one end, yes, we're supposed to work on that relationship with him. We're supposed to believe in him. We're supposed to look at him as our protection and our shield. But then on the other end, what are we doing with that? All those blessings we receive. Are we letting that to transform our life? And then we we receive the peace from God. So when we are have that peace, when we have that joy, we could still go out and serve and help others and serve others and be a blessing to society be a light to this world because that's the purpose of our existence so it's deeper than just saying okay i'm your protection it's supposed to come into our life permeate our life and transform our whole being so that we can go out there and now live as disciples and love and be a light to this world and be as jesus would be if he was dwelling inside of us but he is dwelling inside of us so we are commanded and called to go and fulfill that purpose because christ is within us so Abraham is fearful that he wouldn't receive a child. He's questioning his lineage, his future. And that's what he's really worried about. He's worried about his future because Abraham is worried. He's worried. Oh, am I going to have the child? Am I going to be, be able to fulfill it? And Jesus is talking to Abraham. He's saying, I'm coming. I'm your great reward. I'm your shield. Don't be worried. And we see that fulfillment in Matthew 1. So God's promises to Abraham that his reward shall be very great. Now, Abraham is questioning, am I going to be childless? So overall, when you look at this narrative, it's ultimately, if we look at the deepest part of this story, why is this story here? It's ultimately pointing to God's faithfulness in fulfilling his promises. So he made a promise to Abram and Abraham couldn't see that promise fulfilled right then and there. But ultimately, ultimately, when we look at these Old Testament Bible stories, they all point to the to Jesus Christ and the fact that God fulfills his promises. So with that being said, we now can study this word and believe that God fulfills his promises to us. So that's the that's the whole purpose of this narrative to show that God is faithful. God is faithful. God is good. God is a fulfiller of his promises because God does not change. He is the same yesterday today and tomorrow. And guess what? He is good and he's fulfilling his promises within our life. So the reward to Abraham will be his descendants through whom the Messiah, Jesus Christ, because we believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that every Old Testament prophecy and New Testament fulfillment is rooted and grounded in Jesus and the love of Christ and his life, death and resurrection. So we see this being fulfilled in the word of God, but Genesis 15 is one of those foundational texts where God comes to face to face with humanity and saying, I am your shield. I am your reward. It will be fulfilled. Have faith. And now when we see the life of Christ, when we see the fulfillment of Christ, when we see that Christ is the fulfillment of every Old Testament prophecy and every New Testament fulfillment and the New Jerusalem is a, the ultimate fulfillment of us dwelling with Christ forever. We realize that Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of the reward that God promised to Abraham and to Abram at that time before he became Abraham. So Jesus is our shield. Jesus is our perfect protection. Jesus is the one guiding our hearts in every direction. And this is that phrase that you come in with and you basically use this phrase because you need to continually repeat that because you have somebody listening that might be worried about this or worried about that or um, going through every day. We're worried. We're going through different worries in our life. And the only way we're going to make it through this life is we allow Jesus to be our shield. That we allow Jesus to be our protection because we can make shields. We could try to wait to, to craft our own shields. We could try to wait to craft our own solutions but ultimately god is the one protecting us god is the one that needs to guide our hearts our decisions and show us which way to go
So in this passage, God is reassuring Abram saying, I am your shield. And in the biblical context, what does a shield symbolize? It symbolizes protection. It symbolizes a defense. It just symbolizes security. And this is what Abram was worried about because he was like a homeless going from place to place. He didn't have a settled location where he was building a home or feeling secure. So, of course, he's looking for protection. He's traveling through all these different places, fighting against kings. He's worried about his defense. He's worried about his security. And now we see this New Testament fulfillment of this where Jesus is our protector. Ephesians 6.6, 6, we see the word shield because we see shield in the New Testament. And in Ephesians 6.6, 6, if you turn your Bibles there, you'll see in Ephesians 6.6, 6, Ephesians 6.6, 6, Ephesians 6.6. 6. Ephesians 6.6 6 says, Obey Ephesians 6.16. 6, it says, In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. So if we say, if the New Testament is saying a shield, so wh wh where do we see the New Testament fulfillment of the word shield? Shield, okay, is pointing to the shield of faith. In who? Jesus Christ. So now, we as believers, we as disciples, we have a shield. And what is it? Our faith in who? Jesus. Because when we have faith in Jesus Christ and it comes into our life, it protects us. It gives us strength. It gives us peace. Our faith. So Jesus embodies that shield. So Jesus is the shield. Because why? By believing in Jesus, by having faith in him, he is our shield. His death, his resurrection, his offering from of protection from sin and death. And the Holy Spirit shields us from the attacks of these spiritual forces in the great controversy. So Jesus is the one shielding us. So even within Genesis 15, when we see the word shield, we can look it from an Old Testament promise to a New Testament fulfillment and see that Jesus is our shield. Now, and then we come back to this question, how do we apply it to our lives today? Where in your life do you need shielding? Where in your night life do you need God's help? Where in your life do you need God to come in and give you peace from the stress, the anxiety, all the different things? Where do you see that? Where do you see that shield? Where do you see that shield? There was a Muslim, we heard a story when we went to AWR 360 camp meeting, me and my wife recently went there and a Muslim, he turned Christian and they tried to stab him. His family members tried to stab him with a butcher knife and the butcher knife ended up bending on his back. It didn't go through. It bent and he felt shielded. He became a seven day Adventist. He was studying AWR literature, listening to the radio. And they they said, we're going to come back and kill you, man of God. And then what happened about two weeks later, one of the cousins that tried to kill him, they died in a car accident. Unfortunately. But when you have sin, when you have the devil dwelling inside of you, the same way how you try to stab somebody is the same way you might drive on the road or that aggression. And it led him, them to death. So, so Abraham needed a shield. He needed a shield. And he just overcame the four great kings. But now he was afraid of... What? Maybe they were retaliating. That could be one of his fears. God said, I'm going to protect you. Maybe he was worried about uh, a child. God said, I am your reward. A child is not your greatest reward. Your greatest reward is me, a relationship with me. So that needed to be, that needed to be his foundation so that his whole entire life could have been changed. In he in whom are hid the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, in whom dwells all fullness of the Godhead bodily. Colossians 2, 3 and 9. So this is all pointing us back to Christ. That foundation to be brought into sympathy with him, to know him, to possess him 
as the heart opens more and more to receive his attributes, to know his love and to power, to process the unsearchable riches of Christ, to comprehend more and more what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which pass it, knowledge that ye might be filled with all fullness of God, to be filled with the fullness of God. Jesus. Okay, so this is how now we start to connect Genesis 15.1 to the gospel amen okay so i want us to review this video watch it again pray over it and this is how we point genesis 15 1 to the gospel in jesus let's pray father in heaven thank you for allowing us to see you to meet you in the text the one who is our shield the one who is our protection the one who is our great reward give us the holy spirit so we could preach with faith and help us to continue to preach your word and to honor you in all we live, say, and do, and think. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so this is part two. You could go back and watch part one. You could watch part two again. So that, and then we're going to finish with part three. We have some notes. Uh, we'll take a break and we'll come back for part three. Have a blessed time meditating over this. And you could go back and watch part one and part two to get it concrete more. Because you may have to watch these videos more than once. And then we can finish with part three. And then you can form your sermon. Make it your own. And be able to preach this with your family. With your friends. Maybe at a family reunion. At um, time for devotional time in the morning or the evening. Or if you need to preach for your church. For a small group. In the pulpit on Sabbath. You can make this sermon your own. And be able to preach the word of God. And to uplift the name of Jesus Christ. Blessings. Stay tuned for part three coming next.